Well, good morning. Uh, let's see. I can't remember who I got an email from this weekend, but I'd forgotten to post Thursday's lecture and maybe Wednesday's too. I can't remember. But anyway, I got them up there yesterday, um, at least last night, late after I saw the message. I was working on some other school stuff all weekend. And uh, I'll try to be more up to date um, in the future. We actually got as far into chapter five as I wanted to go, which was really just introducing friction into the equations. They've got other chapters on, or other chapter sections on drag forces, which are um, like taking air resistance into account, and then elasticity, which is stretch and strain, which um, I'm not so concerned with at this point. And so uh, what I'd like to do today is start circular motion and gravitation. And that's those are the subjects in chapter six. And uh, we'll do parts of chapter six. This will be about it for, um, that'll fill up this week anyway. And we might even have a review on um, Thursday, but we'll have our second test next week. And it'll pretty much just be over um, Newton's laws and then the circular motion and gravitation. So it'll be a smaller uh, unit test than the one that we had a couple weeks ago. And then the, the last weeks of the quarter, we'll be looking at, um, well, I think chapter seven, is that where we start energy? Yeah, work energy and energy resources. So we'll learn about dealing with those in the last unit. And then um, momentum and collisions. So those are kind of the usual introductory um, chapters in, in an introductory physics course. I don't know that we'll get to chapter nine, which has uh, torque and statics kind of stuff. But uh, anyway, this week, chapter six, uniform circular motion. And to introduce that. Uh, oh, I have like one question. Um, okay. Kind of late, I think, but um, for the projectile motion lab, um, only one person was supposed to turn in their work, I think, right? Right, yep, okay. one, one person per team, yeah. Yep, and actually if you had somebody on your team that was never there, I think I've had a couple people that kind of vanished. You could let me know when you turn that stuff in. So, just so I'll know. Um, let's see on this thing. Oh, I didn't click share yet. But, uh, yeah, that's focused well enough. All right, for rotational things, which is what we're going to be taking a look at, um, not all of you have had a trigonometry class. And those of you who have often forget some of this stuff. So I was going to introduce a few things about uh, uh, rotations that might be new to some of you or might be review for some of you. But we're going to quickly go beyond that stuff and uh, even if you had the trigonometry, so go beyond that. So I've got a circle drawn here, and circle has a center, and it will also have a radius, and that's the the distance from the center out to the the edge of the circle there, and this will be the length r here is what the radius happens to be. And that constant number is what describes the circle pretty much. Now there's a, in America and lots of the world, most of the time when you're measuring angles, you use things called degrees. And a degree is a little tiny fraction of a circle. It's easier to picture a 90 degree angle, but um, a full circle has 360 degrees in it. 
And so if I drew a line here and then went around all the way around back to here, I would have moved through an angle of 360 degrees. But there's another way to measure angles that's actually more natural. And that other way to measure angles is to take the ratio of the arc length that you have here, this arc length divided by the radius. And that particular way of measuring angles gives you an angle measured in something called radians. And you'd have S over R is equaling the angle. Now you can always translate from radians into degrees and back and forth and do all kinds of stuff. But radian measure is you just take the length of the circular arc and divide by the radius. Now, if you go all the way around a circle, the arc length ends up being two pi radians. So for a full circle, S is 2 pi radians. And there isn't any shorthand notation for a radian like there is for degrees. If you're dealing with radians, you can either write out the word radians or just kind of leave it blank sometimes. Um, if you're, especially if you're expressing it, in, expressing it in multiples of pi, then when you see that pi there, you'll know that. Now, if I take that 2 pi radi or what am I saying? Um, the full circle arc length is 2 pi times the radius. The angle <laughs> is going to be 2 pi times the radius divided by the radius. It's just going to be 2 pi. And so a full circle is equal to 2 pi radians. So you can say that 360 degrees is equal to 2 pi radians. And that's something that we'll be using. Now, um, before too long, we're going to be talking about um, the rate at which this angle changes. And if you have something rotating at a constant rate, it'll turn through the same angle in any given period of time. And so, We'll talk about the idea of angular velocity. And for angular velocity, we'll use this symbol, which is a Greek letter omega, a lowercase Greek letter omega, and it will be delta theta over delta t. And so it's the change in the angle divided by the change in time. And that's another way of measuring a speed. It's a different kind of speed. It's not just a linear motion in this case. It's the rate at which something rotates. Um, for us, a lot of the time, the angular velocity is going to be measured in radians per second. But another way of expressing it is in revolutions per minute, which the abbreviation for that is RPM, and you may have heard of that before. Um, when I was growing up, anybody who had a record, record player would recognize this number, 33 and a third. Um, this would have been the RPM of a, uh, well, a record like one. Okay. Um, this is hard. Are you writing something down or are you just looking at the Word document? Oh, let's see. Did I forget to click share? Yeah. Or are you, I don't know I don't if you're know. just looking at the Word document or if you're like writing something. Oh, let's see. New share. What I wanted to share was this thing. Huh, wonder what you were looking at. Oh well, did it say an automobile accelerates or something? It was the Word document. Okay, yeah, now can you see the, what I was writing on? Yeah. 
or not. Okay. Anyway, that 33 and a third RPM, um, I saved my records. I don't know. Some of these are kind of unique, although, and they were things that looked like this, and uh, they had to turn 33 and a third RPM for an LP record, and this is the way you used to buy music, and uh, it would have all kinds of neat pictures on it and stuff like that, so this was Fleetwood Mac in Chicago. You may have heard of Fleetwood Mac, although they're pretty old now, but before they got popular, they were a blues band, and uh, that was when I really liked their music. But anyway, angular velocity, we use the Greek letter omega equaling delta theta over delta t, and uh, so that's a, something else. And the RPM is another way of writing that. Um, the abbreviation stands for revolutions per minute. And one of the first things we'll do today is convert from revolutions per minute into radians per second. Turns out there are two pi radians per revolution because there are two pi radians in a full circle. And then a minute is just 60 seconds. So we'll be able to do that conversion. But something I always do when I first start this unit, and I do this in any class that studies this stuff, is uh, to look at just a simple rolling problem. And imagine a wheel of radius r rolls without slipping along a horizontal surface for a total of 10 revolutions. Through what angle will the wheel turn in those 10 rotations? Well, each rotation has two pi radians, and so we'll have 10 rotations or revolutions. Um, in astronomy, we distinguish between the term rotation and revolution, but uh, in physics, we don't much. So uh, anyway, 10 rotations. For each rotation, you'll have two pi radians. And so I just say two pi radians per rotation and cross out the rotations and you'll get 20 pi radians. And that's an acceptable way to write a radian angle as just as a multiple of pi. When you studied or if you do study trigonometry at any point, you'll talk about angles of pi over 3 and pi over 6 and pi over 12 and stuff like that. You just express them as fractions of pi. A 90 degree angle is pi divided by 2. So <clears throat> through what distance will the wheel travel during this time? Okay, well for this we have to know that the circumference of the wheel is equal to 2 times pi times the radius of the wheel. It's got a radius of r, and so circumference is 2 times pi times r, and um, Every time you make one roll of the wheel, I don't know if I've got anything just plain round. Oh, here's something. Roll a tape. If I just do one roll of the tape here, I guess I better put a mark on it so I can tell where it is. There we go. I've unrolled the wheel once, and so the distance it travels is just one circumference, and if it undergoes 10 rotations, so 10 rotations times 2 pi r is going to be 20 times pi times the radius is the distance that it'll travel. When I was in high school, um, my junior year, I wanted to, uh, I ran cross country and I would be running track in the spring and there was a street that was about a block away from our house and I wanted to set it up so I could run quarter miles over there doing intervals and in the winter 
and uh, this was in Minnesota. There were some days it was kind of hard to do, but uh, anyway, I did it with my bicycle. I, I went over there and first I put a mark on my um, bicycle wheel like it was a piece of tape or something, and I measured how far the wheel would roll in one complete turn, and then I figured out how many complete turns like that I would have to make to get a full quarter mile, which is 440 yards. And then I just started off at one spot on the street and just counted that many turns as I pedaled along the street and uh, measured off this quarter mile. And so I could do my quarter mile intervals. They plowed the street in the winter time and they did not plow the track at the high school. So I was able to keep running through the winter anyway. Um, but that was how I figured it out. So this thing went 20 pi r, that would be the distance. Now, if it travels those 10 rotations in a time t, what's the linear velocity of the wheel? Well, this is the distance that it traveled, and linear velocity is just d divided by t. But in this case, the distance is those 20 pi times r, and then divide by t. And that's all it would be. What about the angular velocity of the wheel? Well, that would be how many radians it turns through in that time t. And so omega is equal to, whoops, um, delta theta divided by t. And our delta theta is the 20 pi radians. So it would be 20 pi radians divided by t. Okay, I asked a couple more questions about this. Um, what is the ratio of the linear velocity to the angular velocity? Okay, that would be, here's the linear velocity. That would be v over omega is what I'm after here. And it's 20 pi capital R divided by T divided by just 20 pi divided by T for the angular velocity. And everything divides out except the capital R. The 20 pi's divide out, the per, or divided by T's top and bottom divide out, and you just end up with R. And so what you end up with is the linear velocity V will equal R omega. And so if I was riding my bike, if I had some way of, if I happened to remember what the radius of the bike wheel was <clears throat> and could count how many turns it made per second or something, I'd be able to calculate the linear velocity of the, of the bicycle that way. And actually, if you get a speedometer on your bike, what it often measures, <clears throat> at least the first ones I used to get, you'd put a little tiny magnet on one of your spokes on the bike, and there would be a detector that counted how many times that passed by per second. And that was how you figured out how the calculator or speedometer determined your bike speed. Then, What's the ratio of the linear distance traveled to the angle through which the bike turns? Well, the linear distance is just the 20 pi r. So that's the distance. And the angle theta was just 20 pi. And that is also r. So you can say that the distance traveled is equal to r theta. You could call this delta theta if you want to. It's the change in angle. So ends up equaling something like that. And back when I was introducing some of these ideas here, this one where we said s was 2 pi times the radius, okay, that's more or less. s is the like the linear distance, or d, it's like the d that I've got here. So d is equal to the radius times the angle through which the wheel turns. So 
There's our introduction to a little bit of rotational motion. Um, used to be, oh, I used this thing on my computer, or it was a tablet that I would write on, and I'd try to encourage my students, don't conf confuse omega with W. That's an omega. This is a W, and don't get those two mixed up. So try not to. I tend to make them the same way, although if I'm thinking about it, I'll write the W like this, but most of the time I draw it like that. So it's just different contexts. <clears throat> okay. Um, it turns out those constant velocity equations that we used early in the quarter, we can use them again. Um, just to point out those equations, and we'll just write them for x. We're not going to worry about the y tossed into the mix here or anything else. But uh, things we had were that x was equal to x naught plus v naught t. Okay, well, we can express that in terms of rotation. It's just any place there's an x, we replace it with theta. And any place there's a V, we replace it with omega. And so we would write, oh, whoops, not omega, theta is equal to theta naught plus omega. Actually, I didn't put a naught on that, um, or shouldn't have, plus omega t. And this is a constant velocity equation. This is a constant angular velocity equation. Then we had situations where we had acceleration. Oh, I don't know if we're quite ready for that yet. Um, the very first problem starts talking with that. Let me see how far into this chapter that happens to be. Um, oh, it shows up pretty early. So it's just section, whatever it is, point two. Angular acceleration is the case where something is changing the angular velocity. So at one point, it'll have a particular rotational rate, particular number of radians per second it turns through, and then that changes. Like when you first start a wheel rolling, its initial angular velocity is zero. If you roll a tire down a hill, it rolls faster and faster as it goes down the hill, and it would have angular acceleration. And just like linear acceleration is delta V over delta T, angular acceleration is going to be delta omega over delta T. Okay? It's the change in the angular velocity divided by the change in time. We happen to use a Greek letter, another Greek letter. Omega is a Greek letter, but, um, and so is theta. We'll use a Greek letter alpha for angular acceleration. And my approximation of alpha is this. So if you see that, that's an alpha. This is an A. It's a little bit different. Um, in every case here, theta, omega, alpha, we're using the lowercase Greek letters, and there are uppercase versions of them. Um, I don't remember. Well, I think an uppercase theta looks something like this, if I remember right. Um, probably a little more formal than that. An uppercase omega looks like this, it's actually the ohm symbol that's used in electricity is an uppercase omega. And what an uppercase alpha looks like, it might just look like an A, actually. Um, you can investigate these if you uh, use the symbol font in Microsoft Word. And uh, if you just put your computer into symbol font and start typing the alphabet. Uh, you can do upper and lower case and you can figure out what all of these things happen to be. 
and some of them get repeated or don't quite have equivalents because I think there's only 22 letters in the Greek alphabet, so they don't match up perfectly, but that's just something you can do for playing with stuff. Anyway, alpha is delta omega over delta t, and so we'll see. Oh, and constant acceleration equations for x, they were like um, v is equal to v naught plus a t. Well, for a rotation, that would be, replace the v with omega, that would be omega equals omega naught plus alpha t, exact same form of an equation. And then you could have x equals x naught plus v naught t plus one half a t squared. We can make an equation just like that. If there's an x, replace it with theta. So theta equals theta naught plus, if there's a v, replace it with omega, omega naught t plus, if there's an a, replace it with alpha plus one half, forgot that, one half alpha t squared. And so we may not go <clears throat> quite as far into this as we did with uh, constant acceleration stuff, but we will be talking about some of these ideas anyway. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Let's see. So we have an electric motor rotating a workshop grinding wheel at a rate of, that looks like 100 revolutions per minute, 1.00 times 10 squared, but we know three sig figs on that. And that's RPM is switched off. <clears throat> excuse me assuming constant negative acceleration of magnitude. Ah, I got a scratchy throat here. 2.00 radians per second squared. And it's probably, I was out working in the yard yesterday, got to me. Try to wash that down. <clears throat> That's the angular acceleration. I'm going to call this omega naught, and revolutions per minute are units for angular velocity, but they're not the ones that we're going to want. Um, to actually use those equations here, I have to use radians for the angle measure, and radians per second for angular velocity and so forth. So my omega naught, which is 1.00 times 10 squared revolutions per minute, I'm going to need to have those in uh, radians per second. So one revolution is by radians, so I want the revolution from the bottom and the two pi radians on top. And one minute is 60 seconds, so I want the one minute on top and the 60 seconds on the bottom. And that omega naught ends up being a little something or other. Okay, I get about one, oops, excuse me, 10.5 radians per second. So that's the initial angular velocity. And it's got a constant negative acceleration of 2.00 radians per second squared. So I can say that alpha is going to, it's negative, minus 2.00 radians per second squared. Okay, remember our acceleration linear was always meters per second squared. Now it's radians per second squared. How long will it take for the grinding wheel to stop? Well, omega is omega naught plus alpha t. We want to know when this is zero. So we will have 10.5, omega naught is 10.5 radians per second plus, whoops, no, it's minus 2.00.
radians per second squared times t, and we want to know when it's going to stop. So that'll be zero. So bring this to the other side, it becomes positive. Divide both sides by two radians per second squared, and I can see that the t is going to equal 10.5 radians per second divided by 2.00 radians per second squared. And if you divide a radian per second by a radian per second squared, just going to do that off to the side here. Okay, when you divide by a fraction, flip it up top and multiply and you'll have second squared per radian and the radians divide out, seconds squared over seconds are just seconds, so it works. And whatever 10.5 divided by two is, probably 5.25, I think. Yep. 5.25 seconds. So that's that. And then B asks, through how many radians has the wheel turned during the time found in A? Well, I can use my equation for theta to figure this out. Um, I can go theta is equal to theta naught plus omega naught t plus one half alpha t squared. I want to know how many radians it turns to from the time you flip the switch, turn it off until it stops. And so I'll just let this initial angle be zero. Or you could think of theta minus theta naught equaling the angle that it turns through. But anyway, I just plug in the numbers here. I know how long it takes to stop, so omega naught was our 10.5 radians per second. Times the t is 5.25 seconds. Plus, whoops, nope, it's going to be a minus sign because alpha is negative. Minus one half times alpha was 2.00 radians per second squared, and I already put its minus sign there. And then times the time squared, 5.25 seconds squared. And I'm out of room, but that theta will end up being whatever number I get when I plug into there. Let's see, I've got 5.25, I'm going to store it. Um, under T on my calculator, so. I get about 27.6 radians. So that's how far it went. And so I'm studying a whole new kind of motion here, rotational motion, but I'm able to use things that I learned earlier in the quarter. So it's kind of neat. Okay, now we're going the other direction. We have a, a grinding wheel that's initially at rest. It's rotated for eight seconds with a constant angular acceleration, this time a positive angular acceleration. Then it's brought to rest with uniform negative acceleration in 10.0 revolutions. Hmm. Determine the negative acceleration required and the time needed to bring the wheel to rest. Oh boy. Kind of complicated, but let's see what we can do. Let's first just look at those first eight seconds. So,
I could say that uh, I think I want to figure know how fast it's turning after those eight seconds. So uh, omega will equal omega naught plus alpha t and initially at rest means omega naught for this part is zero. And so I just take alpha, the five radians per second squared. And multiply it by the eight seconds. And I can do that in my head. And seconds over seconds squared will leave me a second on the bottom. And I'll get 40.0. radians per second. So that's just fine. Then it's brought to rest with uniform negative acceleration in 10 revolutions. Determine the negative acceleration required and the time needed to bring the wheel to rest. Well first it's asking for the acceleration required and I think I know that because I know how many angles it turns through an equation I didn't write down was the one that looks like v squared equals v naught squared plus 2a times delta x. Well, there's one for rotations. It would be omega squared equals omega naught squared plus 2 alpha delta theta. Huh, okay. Now, this is for the time after the wheel had already been brought to those 40 radians per second. So we're starting this part with an omega naught equal to 40 radians per second. And our omega over here is going to be zero. We're gonna um, bring the wheel to rest by slowing it down. So we're going a little bit different here. But anyway, for this part, um, omega naught is going to be my 40.0 radians per second. And omega is going to be zero. Oh, and delta theta. I can figure that out. It turns through 10 revolutions, but that's 10.0 revolutions times, again, I have to be using radian, so 2 pi radians per revolution. Now they're calling them revolutions. Sometimes we call them rotations. We mix them around here. But anyway, the revolutions divide out, and I would have 20.0, is 10 at 0 times 2. This 2 is an exact integer. Pi radians. That's the angle it turns through. So in this equation, the only thing I don't know is alpha. So doing a little bit of algebra here. This is 0. So I'll have a 0 on the left side. I would get um, minus omega naught squared is going to equal 2 alpha delta theta, or alpha is going to equal minus omega naught squared over 2 delta theta. So that's the symbology. Now I'll just plug in the numbers. So minus omega naught was my 40.0 radians per second. And that has to get squared, divided by 2 times 20.0 pi radians. And on the top unit, I'll have radians squared per second squared. On the bottom, I've got radians. When you divide radians squared by radians, you just get radians. And so I'll end up with, for units, radians per second squared, which is what we measure alpha in. 
And I need to do the plug in the numbers here, but oops, turn on the calculator first. And the bottom ends up being 40 pi. And I get about 12.7, minus 12.7 radians per second squared. So there's that. Whoops, lost my decimal point when I did that. Then it asks the time needed to bring the wheel to rest. Okay, well, I did figure out the angular acceleration that way, avoiding the time equation, or sometimes you can think of this as the avoiding time equation or its versions. So let's um, go ahead and figure out how long that would take to happen. Well, I can think of omega equals omega naught plus alpha t. I know that omega is going to be zero when it stops. And I know omega naught was my 40 radians per second, and I've figured out alpha. So this equation would become zero equals omega naught, which is 40.0 radians per second minus 12.7 radians per second squared times t. And so bring this to the other side and you'd get 12.7 radians per second squared times t is equal to 40.0 radians per second. t is going to equal this thing, 40.0 radians per second divided by 12.7 radians per second squared. So, whatever that ends up being, about three, I think. Oh, <laughs> it looks like pi, actually. Um, 3.14 seconds, and I suspect if you actually did that, it might, I don't know, it's already, it's pretty darn close to pi. But 3.14 seconds, anyway. And I think that's just because of the particular combinations of units they made up. Okay, um, that's kind of neat. You can use stuff we learned before. Um, well, I don't have, I used to have a problem in this set about uh, one of the uh, teachers used to have some kind of a Volkswagen convertible. I can't remember what it was called. But it had pretty large tires on it. And I went out and measured the diameter of the tires one time just to get an idea of the uh, acceleration those tires would experience going from zero to 60 in some number of seconds. But it could have been this. Nope, this is out of a different book. But uh, you have an automobile accelerating from 0 to 30.7 meters per second in 6.03 seconds. This is going to be a little over 60 miles an hour. Not that we care on this problem, but they have diameters of 0 0.422 meters, which would make their radii 0 0.211 meters. So R is 0. 211 meter and it asks what's the angular acceleration of each wheel well here are some equations that i didn't group them together this way but when we were talking about the arc length s is equal to r theta v was equal to r omega and the acceleration was equal to r alpha. So if I figure out the acceleration for going from zero to that in that many seconds, I can figure out the angular acceleration almost as quickly. And 
this is a nice little set of equations that will take you from rotational motion to linear motion or vice versa if you just divide each of these things by r. So let's figure out, well, what I'll get is that the angular acceleration is going to equal the linear acceleration divided by the radius of the wheel. And the linear acceleration is delta v over delta t. It goes from 0 to 30.7. So this would be 30.7 meters per second minus 0 divided by 6.03 seconds. So the acceleration ends up being, this guy would be tromping on the gas to do this. Five point zero nine meters per second squared. And then the alpha would just equal this five point zero nine meters per second squared divided by our radius, which is just half of the diameter, zero point two one one meters. And you could think of that as meters over one, and then you can think meters over second squared divided by meters over one is going to equal one over second squared. Okay, which is the actual units, physical units of um, angular acceleration. But we put a placeholder unit up here of radians per second squared. A radian is not an actual physical unit because it's a ratio of two lengths. It's S divided by R, so meters divided by meters. And we call that a radian, but it's a placeholder word. So anyway, uh, if I divide by 0.211, I get 224 point one, and I just make a note that it is radians per second squared. And it helps when you're talking about an angular acceleration to remind yourself that it's radians up here. So as opposed to revolutions per second squared, we won't use revolutions per second squared ever for an angular acceleration. So you can breathe easy on that. Okay, uh, well that's our introduction to um, rotational motion and this is actually the first two, whoops, excuse me, first two sections of chapter six and uh, tomorrow we'll look at something called centripetal acceleration and that's an acceleration that something an object experiences when it's traveling in a circle it's continually changing direction when it's doing that. And up until this point, we haven't tried to deal with acceleration when something is changing direction. We just know that it's there. Now we'll be able to get a formula for it and put an angle or put a number. On it. And uh, this type of acceleration that we'll look at tomorrow, centripetal acceleration, was the first thing or one of Isaac Newton's very first contributions to science was developing the formula for that. And uh, then once he had that formula, he was able to figure out his law of gravitation, sort of, using that, or at least use it to confirm it. So we'll do that tomorrow. Any questions on what we've been doing here today? I know this is pretty new stuff, but... Uh, I'll put up some, some homework, um, some that'll, let's see, I don't know if on our last sapling assignment, did I have any friction problems in there? Did that sound familiar or not? I may not have had them. I'd like to have one that has a few friction problems and then this rotational stuff that we're going to be doing this week. All righty, and a uh, new lab yesterday, I, I kept forgetting I was preparing material for it, and there was one crucial bit that I forgot to film out there at school, so I had to make another trip out there. But uh, I'll be able to publish a lab for you for this week.
uh, later this afternoon. So we'll go on from there then. Okay, otherwise, I'll see you tomorrow.